My name is Laura Musikatsky. I'm the Executive Director of the Happiness Alliance. Um, by training, I'm a lawyer with a uh, Master's in Business Administration and then two different one-year certificate programs in environmental management and environmental law and regulation, which is my version of a sustainability education. And I see the happiness movement as the other side of the coin of the sustainability movement. And that's um, where my heart is drawn in trying to help the world towards sustainable development and happiness and well-being. A quick introduction to, to myself. Um, I'm a tourism planner and consultant for, for the last 20 years. I got into this by being a backpacker in the Mount Everest National Park in Nepal in 1989. Um, and uh, 10 years later, I ended up with a PhD on what is ecotourism, is the Everest region an example of ecotourism, and was very fortunate to secure some funds out of the UK government and the Department for International Development to promote more responsible and sustainable forms of, of tourism in the Everest region and other parts of, of Nepal. Shortly after that, I worked in Bhutan, which is where I came into contact with the GNH uh, agenda. Um, I've worked in Nepal a number of times over the years. I was very fortunate to be there again in 2011 when their first elected prime minister was working with the, the UN on the global uh, resolution on, on happiness um, and the following year in April 2012 when the Bhutanese convened with the UN uh, what was billed as a high-level meeting on happiness and well-being uh, that's where Laura and I uh, met uh, not physically at that, at that meeting but we came to know of each other's presence at that meeting where there were seven or eight hundred people there and then 18 months ago um, we, we came up uh, with this project uh, Planet Happiness which really has two aims. Um, uh, uh, we'll cover them as we as we go through the, the presentation. Um, Laura, maybe I hand back to you and you want to talk through the sure. a, a bit of background so on in, the Happiness Alliance. Yep, great. Thank you, Paul. So in 2010, the Happiness Alliance was born out of a nonprofit called Sustainable Seattle, which was the first organization to create regional sustainability indicators, working with communities to develop indicators for sustainable development. The Happiness Alliance uh, it was, was a departure from the work of Sustainable Seattle in terms of being a subjective or a survey-based or poll-based uh, way of measuring happiness and, as I mentioned earlier, a dimension of sustainable development. It's based on, our, our measurement is based on the work that Bhutan has been doing, and we actually got permission from Bhutan to use a version of their Gross National Happiness Index. In 2011, we surveyed the population of Seattle, and we used that data to uh, inform the Seattle City Council. And since then, we have had many different governments, many different community organiza organizers, universities um, and businesses use our happiness index in very many different applications, everything from talks to informing statewide and even na national governments. Paul mentioned earlier that we um, first encountered each other at that UN high level meeting, which was um, at the United Nations in New York. It was called uh, UN high-level meeting, well-being and happiness, defining a new economic paradigm. And that meeting was one, maybe the soft official launch, launch of this movement saying that gross domestic product, that measure of all of the goods and services that we produce in a year for a nation is not a sufficient measure for governments to govern for the well-being of their people and that we need a wider measure of well-being. And so today we actually see where in the UK, as now with all of the EU nations, as well as all of the OECD countries, are measuring happiness and well-being in some way or another at varying, at varying levels, which is a huge step forward that we have taken since 2012 with that soft launch. And we're also seeing some governments really taking action at a policy level. So for example, uh, New Zealand now budgets based on 
happiness and well-being measures. So we're seeing some real progress in this. And the Happiness Alliance is um, one of the first, if not the first, these kinds of things are always um, ego driven, so we don't want to get into that. But one of the first, if not the first, small nonprofit that has providing been providing this index, this well-being measurement to anybody who wants to use it at any level. There's been a lot going on in the UK, um, the Bristol Happiness um, Project. They started measuring happiness a bit after us and Action for Happiness started at about um, just about exactly the same time that we started. We were having conversations with Laird when we um, first, first got going in 2010, 2011. But there's been a lot happening. And uh, one of the things that it's been really wonderful to support and be a part of is the work of Planet Happiness. So with that, I hand it back over to Paul. Hey, th thanks, Laura. Um, if people have questions as we move through, then uh, let us know. We can uh, discuss it as, uh, as we go through the, the presentation. Um, so the, the project Planet Happiness basically asks that it, if tourism is a vehicle for development, how can we engage uh, host communities to strengthen their happiness and, and, and well-being, to ensure that the tourism model being developed is benefiting those that it, that it, it should really uh, be benefiting first and foremost. Next slide, Laura. Thanks. So um, we, the idea for it came to, together in August 2018. Um, and so, we're really about supporting inclusive destination planning to avoid over tourism, um, not just to over, not just to avoid over tourism, but to create more responsible and inclusive uh, ap approaches for any destination. Um, and, and we do this as well by building on growing global interest in this uh, happiness and, and well-being uh, movement that uh, Laura alluded to there a, a moment ago. Next slide. So what we do with this approach is partner with local organizations to deploy the Happiness Index Survey, which Laura and the Happiness Alliance have been using for eight, eight years or so. Um, so an individual goes online, they can take the survey in any one of 24 languages we have it available in at the moment. It takes about 15 minutes to complete. And at the end of that survey, you can download your own personal happiness scorecard, which gives your score in blue compared to everybody else uh, who's taken the survey in, in black. So this does a, a couple of things. Firstly, it, it gives you a comparison, you know, with everybody else. So it makes you think about where your strengths and weaknesses, uh, deficiencies are across these uh, different domains. And secondly, by seeing those different domains and the way they're included in the survey, it brings a, a simple understanding or a basic understanding to the survey taker of, of what, is, what is meant, what is defined, if you like, by well-being. Well-being is a term that's used very broadly. People regularly refer to it, but it's generally a kind of woolly term. And what we have through people taking the survey is building an understanding then of, of what it means. And then with that survey scorecard, you can share and discuss with friends, family who may want to take the survey them, themselves. And so it becomes a, a talking point between people about where their strengths and and deficiencies are. And in this conversation with Laura um, 18 months ago, it, it occurred to me that, well, if we can get individual scorecards, then as a tourism planner, this could be very interesting because then we can get the destination scorecard for a host community to, to measure their, their happiness. Sorry, Next Paul. slide. Sorry, yeah, Paul, go just ahead, to, Daniel. Just to ask a question. Uh, so the, the, 
the darker mark is that a reflection of a group of people who have done it or the or just generally who's ever taken it or so is it specific to a location so i ask 50 people to do it mine would be blue and the other 49 would be a reflection of those people yeah if you go to happycounts.org and you take the survey there that'll be a running average of everybody who's taken the survey since 2011. So okay yeah, and if you get a unique URL so that you administer the survey in your population, then that dark line, the, the black line will be for your population. And it okay. will be the running average as you collect the data. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Next slide, thank you. So there are 11 domains that are covered in the, in the survey. I think it's probably best that Laura, you, you talk this through and, and say a few words uh, on each of them. You do this much better than me. <laughs> um, so if we want to think about what do we mean by happiness and well-being, of course, the first thing that you think about um, is how, how do you feel, which um, is a scientist call affect. So we ask those questions of positive and negative affect. Actually, the questions that we ask, in the, we ask the Cantrell ladder, which is uh, a gold standard for satisfaction with life. And then we have four questions that come directly out of the United Kingdom's Office of National Statistics. So that's a question of satisfaction with life. Um, how, how, how much, how do you feel that your life is worthwhile? And then positive affect, how happy are you? And negative affect, which we um, we use the anxiety one as the UK does. Anxiety, knowing, understanding that anxiety is a dimension of um, a, a representation, um, manifestation of depression. Um, so then we ask questions around these different domains and we know that these are all um, correlated and have um, a positive relationship to our satisfaction with life. So community will ask questions probably the most important is do you feel like you belong to community we also have questions about inclusion and um, discrimination as well as questions about safety and there and others when you take the survey you can find that in environment we're asking questions about do you feel like your environment is safe as well as questions around air quality and access to natural environment which if you look at the world happiness report we were really delighted to see that they have a chapter actually on the environment, which is lovely. And incidentally, since we have somebody from the UK, one of the other first projects that really came online is called Mappiness. And um, they used an app where they would gather data from people on how they felt and where they were. And the finding was that people are happiest in the environment, which intuitively we already know. Lifelong yeah. learning, arts and culture. No, we don't call that education. We actually gather data on education in the demographic section because we're really framing this around the lifelong learning piece. And that's about access as well to um, recreation, to learning and to sports. And psychological well-being. Now this is a really interesting, um, the interesting point that we're learning as we're going in this field. The psychological well-being or flourishing or eudaimonia, you good, daimonia, a good life, a good spirit. Are these, the, these are those questions that are about, do you feel like you have a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning of your questions about optimism, um, a sense of your, your life is, is worth living. And, you know, we don't know at this point if these are, if we would think of them as lagging or leading indicators, perhaps psychological, my question personally, I would ask is, are the psychological well-being questions and the, the what we're getting to around this is this really the whole point of all of this where today we're saying it's about satisfaction with life we don't know this field is new enough that these are the questions that even need to be asked around government which is one of the domains that are consistently um, across communities across nations are, are there our scores are really low and we're asking about trust in national as well as local government and um, questions about corruption in health, you're going to be asked that question of yourself, your own, your own self assessment of your health, um, as well as questions about your, um, your activities. And then in standard of living, now this is interesting because we're asking these questions of, um, you know, do you feel like you have enough, which really goes to the really is highly, um, you know, it's, it's a big area that we need to think about in, in terms of sustainable development. So do you feel like you have enough? 
Um, and then other questions of experience. We have questions, experiential questions. So for example, um, do you go without having enough money to buy food? And then social support, another, another aspect of happiness and well-being that's just so important to our overall well-being are questions about our relationships and sense of feeling lonely. Really important right now um, in this time of um, social distancing um, and something that we're really thinking hard about right now, especially with people uh, such as our elders who do not necessarily know how to get online that well and so are really going to be lonely and questions of, about feeling loved. And then in time balance, now Bhutan did something really novel when they added time balance to a well-being measure. Um, so we really want to give salute to them. So there's three different aspects of time balance that are really important. Do you enjoy the things that you're doing? Do you feel like you have enough leisure time? And do you feel rushed? Um, we added the domain of work, which Bhutan hadn't done. Our, our, our current happiness index, which we've been using since 2011, you can look at the methodology. We developed it with um, researchers from San Francisco State University. And the work domain is, are the questions that you would expect in any um, survey for work. Are you satisfied with your work? Do you feel that you have enough resources to be productive? Do you feel that you're um, being paid appropriately for your work? And then we, uh, we um, consulted with experts in the tourism field and then have developed a set of questions which we have published in the International Journal of Community Wellbeing um, that are part of the Happiness Index for Planet Happiness. And that's that's it in a nutshell, <laughs> if the nutshell was really big. <laughs> but I urge you to, if you haven't, to take the happiness index and have um, an experience of it yourself. Next slide to, to, to you, Paul. Yeah, that, yep. Thanks, Laura. It is really important um, to, uh, to, to take the survey um, uh, to, to get a feel for what it's about. Um, Ken, ah, the, the version that I've sent to you, Laura, that indicates that it's not the, the, the final version. Sorry for that. Could, could you, well, could you just go back one slide just to check? It, it just came straight, yeah. Oh, dear me. Uh, then in which case, can you go on two slides? I think it will flow better if we go on two slides. So just as we take the survey um, and get a scorecard as, a, as an individual, as I mentioned a, a moment ago, if we then deploy the survey in a, in a visitor destination, in a tourism destination, we get a, a scorecard which you can see on the left uh, for the destination. Um, this one comes from Bali, and so on a quick glance, it gives the indication that the survey takers in Bali uh, are happier on average than uh, most people who, who take the, the survey. So, you know, that's a one page scorecard that can be used through different media to start conversations with host communities. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have a, another one page scorecard which removes the comparison with everybody else, stacks them from low to high, and then it allows us to, to say, well, <coughs> what interventions might be needed to strengthen those uh, deficient or lower score lines. So in the case of, of, of Bali, we have access to lifelong learning the arts and culture, work leisure time balance, a uh, sense of community and, and trust in government. So what is required there that is gonna you know, lift the, the whole ship, so to speak. Um, and so, what we can then do when we're bringing together different workshops with different stakeholders as part of a tourism planning process is ask for suggestions as to what interventions are needed. They can be designed, they can be included in the destination management plan if the, the cycle of work uh, fits with that. And then, you know, a, an iteration of the survey can be carried out again after that, after these, um, interventions, actions, activities have, have been um, implemented. Um, if we go back one slide then, Laura, 
Now, why I think this is important is over the last 20 years, I've, I've prepared dozens and dozens of destination management plans. And when we, we do this, it's very easy to engage with government, all the different departments, not just tourism, of course, uh, but culture, environment, transport, they all come to focus group meetings or consultative workshops where you can discuss issues, present solutions. And equally so with the private sector, um, the, which are usually clustered into associations, you know, the, the hotels, the transport providers, the handicraft makers, the, the tour guides, they will all, all be represented in a tourism stakeholder environment. But trying to, to get representation from the community and in trying to engage the community in this process is, is not so easy. So by using these scorecards uh, through social media um, and, and convening different groups of the community to discuss individual collective well-being, how tourism should be developed to strengthen their well-being, it gives new life, life new inclusivity to this, uh, to this process. Next slide. So besides those one page scorecards, we have um, destination reports that would be a combination of the survey results and the issues, uh, the tourism development issues that the destination is, is facing. So for, for those people interested to, to take their, uh, you know, to look further at issues and think through solutions and become engaged in the process of destination planning or in the process of uh, strengthening host community well-being, there are resources that can be used by different groups um, to, to carry that conversation forward. Um, and then of course, results from one site can be discussed across between other, other sites. Uh, the results can be picked up by the, by the media, journalists, it can be used in conferences to carry this conversation forward, which is going to uh, help provide solutions for, certainly for over tourism, but in other destinations where they require more tourists, it helps map out what uh, different activities, what tour products, what uh, uh, actions the tourism sector can be taking to, to carry everybody together uh, as, a, as a more cohesive and responsible destination. Next slide. Um, and equally, you know, yep, we can contrast uh, and compare uh, different sites, different destinations. We can select particular uh, data uh, to compare across sites all the time, looking for best practices that can be that can be shared across across sites, and all the time deepening people's understanding of this happiness and well-being agenda, um, which helps us all move beyond GDP. Next slide. Now, for the purposes of, of Planet Happiness, we've decided to, to focus on World Heritage Sites. This is a, an approach that can be used anywhere, uh, but we have selected, decided to work with World Heritage Sites for specific reasons. Uh, firstly, if you're going to deploy the survey in a given area, then you need to know where the boundaries of that, of that destination are. And if we were to pick Barcelona, for example, you know, where does, where does the limits of the survey deployment uh, finish? So by selecting World Heritage Sites, that, that helps us address that, that question, um, and makes it easier for, for partnerships to, to develop, I feel. Um, and equally, you know, to carry this conversation forward with the media, we need to be able to focus on on something rather than embrace all destinations all over the, the world, which would, which would be a, a very difficult conversation to, to carry forward. If we focus on World Heritage Sites, uh, many of which are already under tourism stress, then that helps us create a clearer narrative uh, for, the, for the project. And we have a, you know, a mixture, obviously, of natural and cultural sites. Um, which, um, which allows us to, to include conversations about the importance of culture and biodiversity ecosystems in, in global sustainability. So, you know, these are some of the, 
the, the simple reasons as to why we've we're focusing on on world heritage sites we don't if we have clients partners coming to us that want to apply this in in other areas we we can certainly do that and and we we are and you'll hear more about this in in other presentations thanks laura next uh, next slide now to carry the work forward we have partnerships really we're seeking to make with three different types of organizations firstly the destination management organizations uh, so those dmos might be at the site level or they might be at the at the national level uh, in Thailand, for example, there is a, a government department um, called uh, DASTA, Designated Areas for Sustainable Tourism Administration, that focuses in particular on community-based tourism in nine destinations around the country. And we've signed a partnership agreement with, with DASTA to, to work with DASTA. Um, in Canada, we've just recently signed uh, an MOU uh, with a local university and the, and a, a DMO, uh, a tourism organisation. So yeah, I think it would be quite straightforward to understand why uh, why DMOs are, are important. And universities, because this work is very data rich, uh, because many university departments have tourism departments or development departments, then there is a natural fit for partnering with uh, universities to deliver win-wins uh, in terms of writing academic papers, in terms of gaining local expertise to support tourism planning uh, moving moving forward. Um, when we another point is when we move forward with initial deployment of the survey, because it is online, it's quite cost effective to do this through convenience sampling online. But if you want to move to a more diligent process that the government is going to buy into, they will generally require random sampling approaches, which again, universities can be well placed to, to partner with. Uh, and then thirdly, corporates. Um, we're interested to work with corporates in the tourism sector that recognize the the value of the approach that we are taking and that want to illustrate to their customers and clients that sustainability that responsible tourism that looking after the well-being of host communities is at the core of their of their business strategy so they're the different partners we we look to work with um, laura mentioned a moment ago that for each destination that we work with, we can assign a, a URL uh, that allows, allows you to, you know, obviously collect the data specifically for your site. It also allows you to adapt if you need to the survey a little bit to meet the uh, specifics of your destinations. For example, by adding questions that are specific to, to the issues that the, the destination is, is facing. Um, and then lastly, when the project, uh, we haven't got to this stage yet, but when we get to a stage where destinations uh, have 200 survey takers, then we can put the, put the, uh, the, the one page scorecards on the, on the website for, for quick uh, comparisons be, between sites and to build interest. Laura, the next one, I think, um, I'll hand over to you here, and you, you might want to talk through this one, Laura. Yeah, yeah we, we, this is actually a published methodology that I mentioned in that article that's the, um, about the planet happiness in the International Journal of Community Wellbeing, which is actually free for download, it's open source. So our methodology is based very much based on grassroots activism. I mentioned that this comes from Sustainable Seattle being the um, first organization that created regional sustainability indicators. And they did that through uh, the process of participatory action research. We, we built this based on um, really learning from our, our history. So the first piece is convening um, stakeholders. So that would be, um, Bhopal already went into those, who those people, um, who those stakeholders would be. And then really building awareness and engagement. A lot of people don't even know that this happiness movement is happening, but it's very attractive because it is really a, about what really matters. 
for to let people know that governments are starting to really consider this and that this is something that really does matter and that one can take action at in um, at, at a local level is an important part of this work at that point then one can deploy the happiness index so you start gathering that data and then um, it depends upon the circumstances of the um, of the project and, and of the area of who would do the data analysis so for example at the university level then one would expect that the, the um, if the, the academic people who are undertaking this have the the knowledge and the desire then they can do the analysis uh, Lire is an academic as well as a community activist and she did a beautiful report after she had gathered data in the Pam Pamploma which perhaps Lydia, you could put that into the chat function. That would be really nice for people to see. Uh, we have an, another example of a report that we did for, um, for Indonesia, which is on, on, the, on, our, um, on our website. Um, at that point, when now that you have the, da the data and, and you've created these reports, now it's time to go back to the community to, ex to explain what the data is and then to gather the feedback from the community from those those who are the the perhaps the most um, the stakeholders who are at the most heart of this work to sit to find what do they want to do in their own lives and in their community and what do they want to has have the other stakeholders whether it's the government or the DMOs to do around these issues of happiness and well-being now understand that at this point there's been quite a bit of awareness raising and and education about what we need by happiness and well-being and then comes naturally implementing upon these um, upon this feedback identifying the intervention and then implementing them and then we want to gather data again right because we want to see what was the impact and it's an iterative process so we've we've done this um, over the years we've done uh, this has happened in a few different areas at different levels um, but as Gus O'Donnell has said a number of times is that we need more evidence and this is something never before has this kind of work this, um, this well-being work been done within the within a container within a narrative mm -hmm. that Paul is implementing now and we really hope that we will be gathering that evidence and that it will not only inform and transform the tourism industry um, which will be in desperate need of transformation after we recover from the current global crisis, but that that will also inform and transform our governments, both at local and international levels. So Paul, I'll turn it back over to you. Just, yeah, sorry, could I just ask a question? Yeah. Uh, Great. Roughly these, the time frame on, on some of your projects from like steps one to six there, what, what do you, have you seen a kind of theme in terms of time frame of how long it takes to get from those steps? So I think that you could say that it would, you would take step one would be, I don't think that I've ever seen it done in less than at least a month and up to six months and then yeah. building the local um, awareness and engagement these that folds into step one and the longer um, the planning and the more um, intentional the implementation is the more successful the project because it really is about doing a whole lot of engagement oftentimes people will put a time frame around deploying the happiness happiness index gathering data about two weeks if they're doing a convenient sampling and really doing a big push to get people to take the index so that can that's a briefer period um, and the data analysis and, re and reporting, which you already know this, it really depends upon the depth at which you're going to do the analysis. So whether it's something that you can put out in, um, you know, in a week where you're doing something much more glossy, or if you really want to go into the data analysis and, and you know, do an academic paper, then who knows, right? A few years. <laughs> but we won't talk about that painful process um, and then convening the community again there's some work that needs to be done um, uh, in in terms of um, re-engaging people and that really depends upon what you did in that step one of who you brought in as as part of your um, as part of your team to do this so if 
um, the really successful projects, these people who have brought it, been brought in, to the, the local um, stakeholders who have been brought in for step one are engaged throughout and that includes the media. Um, so these really successful projects, they essentially, uh, I don't know if one uses this term in the UK, but we call it, they own it. They, they feel like it's theirs. Yeah. And so then when it goes back to the community, they are part of that community and they are acting as very invested bridges in that community. And then in terms of the implementation, um, one of our most successful projects, I would say, would be in um, a small, um, small communities in a region in British Columbia where they used the community convent, commu the community feedback as well as the data to do a second round of, of grants. And so they were able to get an additional million dollars, um, Canadian dollars, to implement some of their well-being actions. Um, so that kind of gives you a ballpark of, you could do something like this very quickly in a very small group where you had something very cohesive and you didn't um, have a whole lot of expectations around a big scale implementation, um, inter I'm sorry, um, intervention, um, or this is something that could take a lot longer. It really depends. And what I would say is, you know, that it's not an either or, it's probably a both and. Just yeah. start small and kind of get a feel for it and then keep building. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Laura. Uh, to give another example, Daniel, um, myself and two other colleagues uh, are currently working on an ADB, Asian Development Bank funded project in, in Laos. Um, and in one of the destinations we're working there, Luang Prabang, which is a planet happiness site, um, yeah, they, we're going to prepare a, you know, a destination management plan. So this will be the first opportunity we have, honestly speaking, to uh, bring this methodology to the, the, the destination planning process. And uh, yeah, we're, we're taking about five or, or six months uh, to bring these steps into a standard consultation process that, that you, know, you would use to, to bring together a, a destination management plan. So we were, we're hoping that this will be the first full example of the process integrated uh, in, into a plan, destination plan process. Um, again, you know, with the virus at the moment, it's just unfortunate because I was supposed to be going out there next month to begin um, steps one and step, step two with the community, um, with the government and with the private sector that is very active in a DMO there. Uh, but inevitably, it's it's going to get uh, delayed a, a little. Um, I could also mention that with some of the other sites that we're partnered with, we have university partners, but we don't have you know DMO partners, if you like, and so they're a little bit more strapped for for cash to be able to to go about the process in a in a diligent way, uh, a well resourced way, um, but you know there are opportunities obviously to look for funds to support implementation and we can talk about that more uh, later uh, either one-to-one -one or or generally uh, in the in the presentation um, Laura do you want to go on to the the next one yeah uh, good so um, we we began just over a year ago with a partnership with with Pata uh, we've GSTC, the Global Sustainable Tourism Council. I'm not sure if you're all familiar with them, but they set out the criteria for sustainability for the industry and for destinations. They um, regularly refer to well-being in their documentation and in their delivery of, of their work. Um, but again, it doesn't really define what is meant by well-being, which is where we come in, which is where the partnership um, is. Um, and, you know, yeah, we can support that process by defining what well-being is and guiding the destinations more uh, strategically, more purposely to, towards uh, that well-being uh, agenda. Um, on the website, uh, we develop pages for each of the different sites we're working with. We have about 17 on the website at the moment. Um, we have conversations growing with a number of other uh, destinations. So we develop a web page for each destination. We include the logos of the partners that we, we have. 
Um, at the bottom there, we, we have some media partners uh, that we're, we are in conversation with. Um, Bhutan, while they don't have any World Heritage Sites, they know very well what we're doing. They are seeking funds to become part of the project and have proposed to convene in Bhutan um, the first Planet Happiness uh, International Conference. Uh, so we're in conversations with them and organizations that, that would be in a position to fund and, and support that, that conference. We don't know when it will take place. Uh, we were hoping later this year, but inevitably that will, will be delayed with the, with the virus situation. Uh, and then there's one more slide at the end, I think, Laura. So with that, uh, if there are any questions that anybody would like to ask, we'll be happy to have a conversation. Yeah, I, yeah I've, I've got, it kind of seems that it, if I wanted to say implement something like this, uh, feels like there's a, there's a more wider community aspect of ha happiness and then it's then tailoring it down more to the tourism industry so I was, I was just trying to think if i was to carry this out at university level or in an area or in, in my city you almost kind of want to capture the wider feeling of what happiness is to that community and then in certain circumstances like you're doing yourselves the smaller projects or the world heritage sites looking at how that relationship of happiness is with tourism is that is that correct um i would uh, is it correct? I, I think much depends on on who you who the local champions are to yeah. to the conversations that are sparked off at the initial stage um, on how suitable this approach is or how timely it is, how useful it is to the to the location, um, and uh, I think it's possible to to. Well, one needs to start with um, an organization, not just a university, but a, a collection of stakeholders that have a common interest in the, in the work. Um, and then by familiarizing that core team with, with the concepts of, of happiness and putting into place press releases that can go out that explain what you're doing, um, and, and moving the work forward, as Laura said a moment ago, in a, in a small way to begin with, and then to build on that as, as interest g grows, is, is probably the best way to go, to go forward, um, unless a government or a research project is there to, to go at it in a, in a much stronger way. Yeah. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, no, it does. It does. Yeah, definitely. I'm just thinking with your World Heritage Site approach, how do you define the boundaries within those World Heritage Sites? Is it people who are, how do you, do you break up the, tour, the people, the local people involved in tourism in any type of framework or is there just a, who you can get hold of in terms yeah, of right. World Heritage Sites? You have a lot of people living and working just outside mm. the World Heritage Site within tourism. Are they involved in it? Yeah. Okay. So again, it will vary from one uh, World Heritage Site to another. There are World Heritage Sites that we're partnered with. Uh, there's one in Olmanuk, I think it is called, uh, pronounced, uh, in, uh, in the Czech Republic, which is, which is more a monument. Uh, so rather than a large geographical area like uh, Ironbridge, which covers, you know, a number of living communities, yeah. it's a standalone monument. So the approach for how you would want to embrace the surrounding community in that monument site will be defined by the level of tourism activity around the, the monument. In Ironbridge, um, as I say, you, you know, within the boundary of the World Heritage Site, you, you have a number of communities living. And so that's a, a different approach to think through on how you would deploy. And many times these days, World Heritage Sites will have a buffer zone. So again, you know, that allows you to, to target communities in the World Heritage Site and on the periphery of the, of the World Heritage Site. Now, most World Heritage Sites will have a site coordinator. 
So Kew Gardens uh, in the UK, uh, for, for example, they uh, are happy to work with us. Uh, they don't have um, staff within Kew Gardens that they can dedicate to the project. They're looking for a, a university, an organisation they can work with to take on board that, that responsibility. Um, but through you know, the work of the Heritage Site Coordinator, they already have an outreach programme to the, the community, to the stakeholders, to the retailers, uh, that, and they, they have lines of dialogue, newsletters that, that go out to those stakeholders. So that would be an example of one where you already have a, um, a network of stakeholders already engaged that it's, that it's possible to reach out to, to to take the methodology forward. Absolutely. Um, we're coming up to the hour. I'm wondering, Larry, did you want to say a few things about your experience? Would you be comfortable doing that, Letty? Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Did you mean with the report that I prepared? Yeah. Or with how, yeah. gathering your data and your report and um, yeah. Yeah, what, um, what I did with the data from, I think it was 2018, right? You provided, uh, we analyzed those data and uh, we did a very deep statistic, statistical analysis and we found a lot of um, uh, insights, you know? It, it was just a theoretical analysis, but it was very useful to see correlations, to see um, the, the, the different, the, the comparison between the general sample and the results from my region. And uh, we haven't used it for policy making uh, purposes, but um, I think you can get a lot of excellent information to to propose different interventions with the community. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Nicole, uh, hi there, Nicole. You came oh, in. A bit late there. Yeah. Everybody else at the beginning had the opportunity to introduce themselves a little bit. Oh, you... so, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm here in South Korea, um, and oh. I'm working uh, from Canada actually originally. I was curious which university in Canada you're partnering with when you mentioned that in your talk. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm at a small community college uh, here called Indec University. I've been here for about 20 years. I'm in the tourism department, but it's uh, more of a, a business oriented service management, tourism service management department. And um, I was actually curious too, who your partner here is in Korea. I was wondering if it was Catherine Germain Hamel, who you were partnering with here in ROK. Um, you, you, men you mentioned that, but, but uh, yeah, actually, I do have two questions, and let me just kind of um, throw them out here. It's a little bit, um, taking some notes and I um, one of the questions is I know it's, it's kind of an abstract um, somewhat abstract qualitative research is always a little bit more abstract I think uh, and that and my question is kind of um, maybe even more abstract from the abstraction in the sense that I'm quite curious of the different uh, 11 different domains of well-being that you mentioned um, has there any has there been any research that um, to indicate if you if you kind of go off from this kind of um, mm, standard standardization, how long before negativity would take, come into effect? Um, so, for example, environment. If if there is, I mean, it's, again, it's kind of abstract to say environment was a level seven. Well, how much time? would be required of yourself away from the environment before you would feel like detrimental um, uh, effects or really feel like the pull of unhappiness. I, I guess it's, it's really kind of an abstract thing, right? So yeah, do you understand I, what I mean though, the I, point? I, I, yeah, I, I've not heard of research that is saying that. I know that, um, that, that you know, there are um, positive and like if you look at the um, World Happiness Report for 2020 that was just issued on March 20th, um, 
that there are negative and positive correlations with some of the different SDG sustainable development goals. And I think it's climate change and um, yeah, uh, sustainable. Help, yeah, sustainable consumption and production. Yeah, that has a negative correlation with with well being, which th and this is something that I think uh, this is not answering your question, mm -hmm. but I think that this is something that is really saying something about what our state of mind is, um, and you know what is it that um, we're not understanding in terms of what it means to be humans as the planet instead of like humans dominating the planet. But this question of, um, you know, if you are deprived, you know, what at what point mm. is in your deprivation of, mm. um, I'm sure there's lots of research out there, but I haven't, I haven't looked at that. You know, it would be interesting mm. to see if you could go at, at, across each domain and see like what happens, you know, what are the incremental right, like, effects like, of expect, being deprived, you know? <laughs> especially these days with this isolation period and just curious about like the community aspect. Is it, is it really two weeks and you feel deprived? Some people are feeling deprived at two days, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Like, I mean, really it's quite a, um, like a, an abstract thing. So it's like, I'm sure it's, but all of it is kind of abstract thinking and, and it's interesting to try to quantify these kind of abstract qualitative yeah. kind of concepts. Right. The it other would, question, sorry. Yeah. It would just be, it would be interesting if we could get, you know, if we had, if we could use a happy, uh, a well, the happiness well-being index to look at, you know, what are people's scores after a certain amount, you know, after <laughs> if we had a, 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 a right. um, you know, a, a panel that would be really that, interesting to see what happened with this yeah, because, yeah. yeah. my other question is um it's a different topic and i don't know if we have time because it's after six right so uh, how are the people question in the, in nicole let's uh, let's okay. see <laughs> um um because i am coming more from a business orientated uh university slash college what we're really interested in um we just got a 15 million dollar grant uh, from Seoul city government as well as um, the national uh, government, and um, we're looking. We are really interested in what they call chung up. Chung up means uh, industry, um, small business oriented uh, startups for students and uh, community, and um, uh, I'm wondering how this happiness index survey that you're talking about uh, uh, is that how how can that be used to help to generate jobs i guess that's again i guess case by case isn't it because it would depend on what results are found within the right yeah but really we're looking at job creation right um yeah so uh, i think i think um, like so I'll give a couple of exa uh, one example. Um, so, for example, in Brazil, Susan Andrews started this work in Brazil, and they uh, they worked in a community in um, some in the state in the state of São Paulo, which is where the city of São Paulo is. But there's lots of different different other towns and cities there. Um, and on their second round, when they went to the community, what the community said is that we need more access to clean water. And so that was a business intervention. Opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's right. So it was the community saying, this is what we need. And then the, a, a business development that came out of that. So that's where, um, you know, that this could be used for a community to, to help identify entrepreneurial opportunities. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Enjoyed your uh, both of your uh, uh, presentation today. I'm getting used to the Zoom thing myself, so <laughs> I'm not sure if I. I think I think it's recording. Like, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know you could see my face. I can't see mine. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. No, thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, th thanks everyone. Uh, Tom, you've just joined. We didn't get the opportunity to hear from you, but please uh, send a, an email to us. It'd be nice to have a conversation with you. Uh, Marjorie, we'll, we'll catch up. Uh, Daniel, it'd be good to, to talk 
talk more. Look, look forward to, to that. I uh, have to jump in a car and drive off and go and get my daughter from uh, the airport two hours away now. So, yeah, I've, I've, got, a, I've got a run. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop. Um, I'm going to stop recording now. And let's all say goodbye before we stop recording. And then we'll, we'll, then we'll end. So we'll say okay, thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> bye bye. <Yeah. laughs>